But unfortunately, he's advised by a number of false friends. I mean, people who consider themselves Trotskyists, one of whom was born in this time, Alan Woods, some of the comrades will know him, others don't, who has put himself forward as a benevolent advisor of, uh, of Hugo Chavez. And he wrote in 2004, Chavez has grasped the fact that the revolution needs to make this qualitative leap. Now, as radical as, Hugh, as Hugo Chavez is, that's a gratuitous statement. I mean, when Tony Benn moved towards the left and the Labour Party, we didn't suddenly say, Tony Benn has seen the light and is about to carry through the socialist revolution. We said, no, if you're carrying through radical pro proposals and in intervening, and these, these are, in, are, are progressive, we will give you support. We will criticise you. It will be done not in a destructive fashion, but in a positive, by suggesting measures that could be taken that would take the movement forward. Unfortunately, this particular comrade and his group have acted as benevolent advisors of radical figures and not taking an independent socialist and Marxist position. And by doing that, by the way, they don't help Chavez. What Tony Benn needed through us in the Labour Party and what Chavez needed is a friendly criticism to push them further than they were prepared to go and particularly to mobilise independently the working class. We never tail-ended, a radical figure never will do. We will give support, but mobilise working people in action to put pressure on these particular figures themselves. It's true that Chavez has broken what has been called the Washington Consensus, which is privatisation, neoliberalism, you know, uh, part-time contracts instead of full-time jobs, and all of the rest that goes with this. Moreover, we don't exaggerate how far things have gone in uh, Venezuela at the present time. John Pilger, who did an excellent doc documentary on TV on Latin America last year, it was a tremendous programme when he compared Venezuela to what happened in Chile and so on. He made the point, even the strict description of him, Chavez, as a radical socialist, usually in the perjudicative, willfully ignores the fact that he is a nationalist and a social democrat. A Labour, many in Britain's Labour Party, would, uh, many in Britain's Labour Party were once proud to wear. In other words, at best, Hugo Chavez is old Labour. Now that's a big advance on new <laughs> Labour. You ask any worker in Britain today, we wouldn't say, no, no, we don't want this. If you had a party that was like old Labour in Britain today, at least it would be a vehicle for the working class. But it's not the final answer. It's not going to solve the problems of the working class, it's the beginning. It's perhaps the ABC, it's not the final letter of the socialist alphabet, so to speak. It would mean that we would have to then push such a party, which will be created in Britain, towards the left to solve the problems of the working class as well. Now we warned Chavez constantly in Armatil, in a friendly way, and not just here, thousands of miles away in Swansea, but a handful of comrades in Venezuela, working in the organisations of the Venezuelan working class, are saying, yes, it's very good, Hugo Chavez has, has taken the movement forward, but it's necessary for you to go further. It's necessary to introduce workers and peasants councils. It's necessary in the army not to rely on radical army officers. After all, we saw that in the Portuguese revolution. The armed forces movement in Portugal was one of the most radical in history. At one stage, the officers, it's unprecedented, it didn't happen. During the Russian Revolution, for instance, came out in favour of a democratic worker state. But it was from above. It was from the army officers teaching the masses rather than stimulating the independent movement of the working class. And in Portugal, they made mistakes. They played into the hands of the reaction. One of them was to take over a newspaper, which was a Catholic newspaper, linked to the Socialist Party. It was done in a, in a top-down bureaucratic attitude. Instead of proposing the nationalisation of the media resources, and then saying every party, in proportion to its votes in elections, would have full access, which would be a democratic way of, of expressing the different political points of view, it took over, or tried to take over, 
this particular newspaper and that was used by the Socialist Party leaders together with the American Embassy and the West Yemen Embassy to begin to organize a counter-revolutionary movement under the banner of democracy which ultimately rolled back the Portuguese revolution. Now something similar came developed in the course of the movement that took place in Venezuela I I itself, where Chavez took action against a particularly venal radio station that had actually supported the coup against uh, Chavez. So there was no browning points amongst the working class in uh, Venezuela for this particular TV station. But he withdrew the license. He didn't propose the nationalization of the media as a whole, as I've suggested, on the democratic workers' control and management, and that alienated not just the ruling class, that's part of the course, but sections of the middle class, the students, which taken together with the deteriorating economic situation, gave the reaction the, the, the opportunity to come in and under the banner of democracy, try and undermine Chavez. And they got that opportunity when Chavez called a referendum to allow him to stand once more for the presidency. And posed it in personal terms, by the way. The question of whether you are in power for one term, two terms, three terms, and so on, or an individual is secondary to the role of the working class in running and managing society. The Constitution he proposed, through the referendum, had elements of Charles de Gaulle's Constitution in France that he introduced in 1958. The reaction mobilized. We opposed those people. We didn't agree with what Chavez did. But those people who were critical of this Constitution either abstained or advocated the vote against. This vote took place just before Christmas in late this middle December. In that referendum, we gave critical support. We said we're in favor of a yes vote. But our comrades were warning us in Venezuela there was enormous disquiet amongst the masses. There was opposition developing amongst the students, amongst the intellectuals, and so on. And unfortunately, that referendum was defeated. Not so much by the working class voting against, but by an unprecedented 44% of those eligible to vote abstaining in the election itself. This is linked to the, the economic and social situation in Venezuela. A revolution is not just an idea, unless it is, unless it is linked to a material change or the hope of change in the conditions of the masses, at certain stages they'll become passive and they will uh, go back in, 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 from their previous uh, position. You have in Venezuela today a murder rate of 11 people killed every day in Venezuela. I myself have seen in South Africa, I've seen it in Rio as, well, as I will mention in a moment, the way that the social and economic situation is organically linked to crime. Of course, there's many reasons, but the fundamental reasons is the social disparity that exists in society. And you have a murder rate in Caracas that is higher than Rio de Janeiro at the present time. That's bound to have an effect on the masses living in the urban areas itself. Yes, there have been some reforms carried through. Unemployment has gone down. The workers and the peasants in particular in the, in the rural areas have gained by the reforms carried through by Chavez. But, unfortunately, this has been financed largely by oil. This is the great advantage the Venezuelan Revolution has over the Cuban Revolution, for instance, because Fidel Castro had no oil, and that's why he turned to Russia in 1960, and he who pays the piper calls the tune, the price of Cuba turning towards Russia was to introduce into Cuba, in basic outline, the same kind of Stalinist regime politically as existed in Russia as a consequence. Now, there was more room for maneuver because of the, 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 the increase in the price of oil. But conversely, what's going to happen if the oil price, price collapses, and it will, it's already gone down to $90 a barrel, in the event of a serious world economic crisis, the resources of Venezuela, the resources of Hugo Chavez could be cut by 50% or more, and it's happened before, by the way, with radical regimes in the history of Venezuela itself.